Thank you. Uh, I will continue from yesterday. Everything I speak about today is joint with Bergen and Gumbard. And uh, in fact, Bergen will give the second of two lectures. This is the first of two lectures on the same topic. Unfortunately, he can't be here, so we will actually have him here on a monitor lecturing on Thursday. So it should be quite interesting to see how they work. <laughs> Hopefully, it'll work out well. OK, I will turn the pages for him and, and for myself now. OK, so uh, as I explained in the first lecture, uh, in my overview of thin matrix groups, uh, I set it up for this purpose of this lecture, where the orbit that we may be considering need not be an orbit of a linear action, but actually of a more general <coughs> action of polynomial morphisms of affine space. And that's the setting in which we'll be talking today. But just to remind you of yesterday, yesterday of, of the classical kind of situation where the orbit is not thin and where strong approximation, which is our interest here, is well understood. Let's take a quadratic form in three variables. I'm interested in this lecture just in three variables, <laughs> affine space in three, three, three variables. So I look at a quadric, f of x equals m. Assume f is indefinite over the reals so that the orthogonal group of f, O, f, z, is going to be a large group something like SL2Z or that, something of that complexity it's sitting in SL, SO21. Uh, then if we have an integer point on this, on, on, on VM, then this group will move the points there and there'll be finitely many orbits by a classical theorem as this. Minkowski maybe in the setting. And you could ask about strong approximation, meaning whether the reduction of VM at integers to VMZ mod QZ or any variant of that is true. And the orthogonal group's not simply connected, so you have to pass to the double spin double cover and then everything is restored and strong approximation is true. And this is quite a remarkable theorem, even for quadrics in three variables. So it's this kind of thing we're trying to understand and I'm going to turn to cubics. And for cubics, we know almost nothing. So I'll, I'll show you that. We know, but I'm talking about cubic equations over the integers. Uh, why go to A3 if I'm in A2? So if I have an equation, a cubic equation in two variables, plain cubic, then it's an old theorem of Ziegel. There are only finitely many integer points. So I'm not looking at rational points. I'm looking at integer points. Rational points is a different story and a, and a very important story, but I'm interested in integer points here. So an old theorem of Ziegel will say there are only finitely many integer points, so we're certainly not going to have strong approximation or the risky density or anything of that nature. Uh, when we turn to three variables and you have a affine cubic, so it's an affine model of a cubic. I mean, if we made a projective, we have some affine model. We'll always be taking some equation. So there are conjectures of Voita, very powerful conjectures, of which even some cases are known in the setting, which say that the set of integer points on a cubic is going to be very limited. So if the divisor at infinity is in any kind of general position, the, only going the, the, the set of integer points should never be Zariski dense, for example. So the kind of cubic equation I'm going to look at has to not be of that type, otherwise it would be a violation of Voiter, and I don't think anybody is doubting. And just to explain what I would love to say something about, but no, mankind seems to be able to say nothing about. So the first equation was, <laughs> which numbers are sum of three squares? It's a hard problem. It's much more difficult than you might think. But we understand that. Actually, sum of three squares over a general number field, we only understand ineffectively. So the quadratic equation over the integers for three variables is not in such good shape as it should be, even though it sounds like it's something very simple. Which numbers are sum of three cubes? I allow negative numbers. Mankind knows nothing about this. This is one of the mysteries. <laughs> uh, Mordell, who liked cubics, as you know, uh, laments that this problem is probably as hard as understanding whether the digits of pi or normal is pi a normal number. If you actually look at this, there is a <coughs> obstruction. If m is not 4, 5, mod 9, then you might, there's no reason not to have a solution. And for all we know, there will always be a solution, and in fact, infinitely many solutions. But they are extremely sparse, so that if, if you go to a computer and you take certain M's, you just don't find solutions, and then people 
declare they know solutions and then other people search further and do find solutions. So they are extremely sparse and we really know very little about which numbers are sum of three cubed. There are numbers for which we do know that they are sum of three cubed, but this question, except for very special M, this question of whether there are infinitely many solutions or whether it might even satisfy strong approximation in some form is very mysterious. In its strongest form, strong approximation fails. This was a quite keen insight of Castles, who used cubic reciprocity <coughs> to show that with M is 3, if you look mod 9, there's a certain relation that can't occur, <coughs> a global relation. But when I talk about strong approximation now, I'll be interested first just in large primes and not some small irregularity that is picked up. And in fact, there's a very nice paper of Coyot, Pelin, and Wittenberg, which uh, discusses a uh, brouwer manin obstruction over the integers. The usual brouwer manin obstruction has got to do with rationals, which is a certificate for non-existence of solutions, or maybe non-existence of strong approximation. They have developed it over the integers, which turns out to be just an extension of this idea of Castles and Heath-Brown, and shows that there is s some global obstruction for every such M for very, very strong approximation. But basically, we know nothing about that equation. And the reason we don't is we don't know how to produce new points from old points. And things like the Hardy-Littlewood circle method are completely hopeless in a situation like this. So if you don't have algebra or something like that to help you, we don't understand this. And so I'm going to turn to the a, a, a cubic that has been at the center of many, many things. And now it's a diophantine theory seems to be quite uh, attractive because it does seem to satisfy strong approximation, and that's what the, the content of this talk is. So I'm not going to look at this equation, which is a lot prettier than that equation, just when you <laughs> stare at it. Uh, but this equation has a group acting on it, and that is the setting in which I spoke yesterday. I said, suppose that we actually have a way of generating new points from old points that satisfy the equation, then we have this orbit and if their z points consist of one orbit, we in the non-thin case, and in if they're infinitely many orbits, and we'll see both of them here. Thin will enter. All right, so the Markov surface itself is the cubic, affine cubic, given by that equation, phi of x equal to zero. Yeah, that's what... If you homogenize this and look at rational points, this is a trivial equation. So I'm really interested in integer solutions to an affine equation. And it's a bit like Weierstrass form. You'll see I'll, I'll uh, so these are affine, you'll see we'll be looking at affine pieces of the most general projective cubic, but affine pieces are the way you cut out <coughs> Scott divisor at infinity. Yeah, that is why you find this disturbing, <laughs> but that's still not homogeneous, that one. So. All right, this is uh, an equation which, uh, by the end of this lecture, if you think it's not interesting, then I have not done my job. Okay, so let's look at this affine cubic. The positive integer solutions to this equation are called Markov triples. I'll say why he was interested in it in a second. And the coordinates of any Markov triple are called Markov numbers. They're historically of great importance. And there's something called the Markov tree. There's a way of making you start with a triple, one solution that we all see immediately is 1, 1, 1. You can make new solutions from old solutions by certain affine morphisms that I'm going to discuss. This is how you might give birth to new solutions. And <coughs> the Markov numbers are this very Lacanry sequence about which very little is known, Any, anything diophantine is known. So the process of producing the new solutions from the old solution is given by certain group, which is very similar to the Apollonian move that Elena was explaining yesterday, these Vieta moves. Firstly, we could, if you recall the equation, you could permute this, the coordinates. But another thing you can do <coughs> is, because it's a cubic equation, uh, but of special type, where's it gone? If I fix x1 and x2, this is an equation x3, which is quadratic. So if I have a solution which is an integer, because the x3 is a co the coefficient in front of x3 is a 1, the other solution will also be an integer. And if you work out 
What that does, it takes x1, x2, x3, but this is a cubic equation to x1, x2, x3, x1, x2 minus x3. So in the Apollonian, this was a, a, a linear transformation, and now this is a nonlinear involution. And unfortunately, when you start to compose nonlinear maps, their degree grows very quickly. So this is a nonlinear group of affine morphisms of three space, exactly the way I described it yesterday. And the orbit of 1, 1, 1 actually gives me all solutions. So this is a case where it's certainly not thin in that <coughs> sense. If I ever want to study Markov numbers, as Markov observed, you, you just have to understand this orbit. Markov himself was interested in these Markov triples because they are, give rise to what's called the Markov spectrum and give you the worst approximable numbers in the world. So the golden ratio corresponds to the root 1, 1, 1. The next guy in the tree corresponds to the next worst Diophantine quadratic third, which in Diophantine approximation, and it's got a continued fraction, which continued fraction of the golden ratio is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And there's a translation, and this really is his interest. It's a beautiful paper he wrote, the real paper that brings us to the modern way we look at all these things is due to Frobenius, and I'll return to that in a second. There is an interpretation due to Harvey Cohn in the 60s, which probably was known to Fricke and Klein, I would guess, that the simple closed geodesic on a once punctured hyperbolic surface, which is a specific subgroup of SL2Z, is essentially in 1, 1 correspondence, these simple closed geodesics, with Markov triples, which is looking at things, which plays a role in one of the, the sub arguments that we have at the very end that Bogan will explain. There are parts of it, which are quite striking, but I don't have time, so I won't go through that. But let me just say, there's very little known in the literature, even though this has been around for more than 100 years, about the Diophantine properties of this Markov equation. But it's got this at least know there are a lot of points. And there's the risky dense. That's very easy to see. Now, Frobenius makes the observation that he was interested in these Markov numbers and asked many questions about them in this paper of his. So if I look at a Markov number and I reduce it modulo p, where p is congruent to, remember Markov number is just a coordinate of one of these triples. If I reduce it modulo p, where p is congruent to 3 modulo 4, then it can never be minus 2 thirds. p is not 3. And the reason for that is just a local obstruction, because if you look at the Markov equation modulo p, you have an equation that this is not possible. So there's a local obstruction, but he stops short of asking is this the only local congruence obstruction? And that's the question of strong approximation. And I think if he had a computer, he would have checked, like we checked very quickly, what, <laughs> what the, is strong approximation true, perhaps, for this cubic equation? And that's our main conjecture, which uh, has not been checked numerically as far as I would like. This was checked already 10 years ago when we started working on this. So the main conjecture for primes and I'll only state it here for primes and discuss the primes, it will be Bogan who discusses the general composite, is that strong approximation is true for the Markov equation itself. Now, because the orbit of 1, 1, 1 gives me all the integer points, if I want to understand if reducing modulo p, I get all the integer points, mod p, it's clearly, a, uh, because I have this group action, the group acts, it descends and acts on the solutions modulo p, it's acting by permutations, very different to the linear case where this acts uh, with a linear group, and then we just uh, have a, these theorems of strong approximation. So here we are acting by permutations. And if I'm going to have strong approximation, if I'm going to hit every solution other than 0, 0, 0, remember 0, 0, 0 is going to come back with a vengeance. Uh, that's just one orbit. <laughs> Except that I must have that there's only one orbit that this permutation group acts transitively on the solutions. That's really what I want to know. And to strong approximation, <coughs> mod p, at least for primes, for this equation xc. So our main conjecture is that this is true. Check numerically first for primes up to about 500. In fact, the permutation group seems to be the full alternating or symmetric group. It seems to be very large on, on the set of solutions. And moreover, the graphs the obvious congruence graphs that I defined yesterday in the setting 
uh, or numerically expand this. But we have no idea how to prove that. And we don't have any use of it because this is a sieve problem that's much more difficult because the sequence is lacanary. So in lacanary situations, the spectral gap doesn't help you much. The first question we're trying to understand is just what happens mod p. And I stated in two theorems because the logic of this is we make it in two steps. So the first theorem is that there is a giant orbit for the action of, the mo of this nonlinear morphism group on this finite set X star P. That is, there's an orbit, we call it a cage, CP, such that the, its size in, in, I'm removed zero, zero. Its size in the complement is at most P to the epsilon. You give yourself epsilon positive. So the complement, it's all, this giant component is all but P to the epsilon of the points for any epsilon positive. Here P is large. It's a simple matter to count how many solutions there are to the, con to the equation, homogeneous or not, that doesn't matter. So x star p is, is, is order p squared. And of the p squared elements, cp is almost all of them. And then this is extremely important. If I'm looking at these uh, transitivity orbits of the action of the, of the Markov moves, there are no very small components. So the best lower bound we have here, if we could improve that a bit, we would solve the whole problem. The best lower bound we have here is that there could be small islands somewhere <laughs> which are not connected to the cage, but if they are, they are at least size log p to the one-third. And in fact, we can prove the whole strong approximation as long as p squared minus 1 is not very smooth. Now, when I, mean, when I say very smooth, I mean very smooth. So if p squared minus 1 were k factorial, our proof fails. There's a range in which we can't connect up two sides of a story. Now, I don't know that there are infinitely many primes of the form p squared minus 1 is k factorial, but there's, a, there's an enemy there, and that enemy we don't know how to deal with, and that's what I mean by very smooth. So we have a very soft, condi uh, mild condition which ensures that the conjecture is true, and from that we can prove that this, so this is a theorem that we use to do any kind of further analysis. We don't know, no. The conjecture is, is there's only one orbit there. So we're not going to get any up of it. Oh, you mean how many bad orbits? I have, yeah, that, that, that's a good question. I have not estimated the number of bad orbits, but uh, you'll see where this lower bound comes from, and then I think it will be kind of clear. The main theorem is that the conjecture which says that uh, the set of primes for which a conjecture fails is tiny. It's at most, this is not a zero density, this is tiny. It's the most p to the epsilon, t to the epsilon for any epsilon. In fact, we could probably make that log, but I can't prove it's finite. And if I could prove that was finite, we could actually search on a computer and completely resolve the problem. So there is a gap, and the gap has to do with these smooth things. This is the main theorem. We essentially proved the conjecture for all but extremely few potential counterexamples, which we <coughs> should, uh, which I don't believe exist. You bet. Which numbers are the sum of three squares over a number field is not solved effectively, so one doesn't even know when that kicks in. That's correct. So then that's squares. <laughs> that's absolutely correct. So I will point out what's effective and what's not in a moment. All right. Now, uh, this is what Bagan will talk about. Uh, we can do com composite moduli, not all composite moduli, but enough to serve, to execute a very, very basic serve, which is what <laughs> one of our aims, one of, this was one of our aims. So we have this, let's say, robust, almost strong approximation. It's enough to prove something very modest. So I just want to point out, this sounds like you're supposed to be proving that the set of Markov numbers, which is this Lacanary sequence, it's very difficult to deal with, like Messant primes, uh, you're supposed to be proving that there are infinitely many Markov numbers which are prime. What are we proving? That almost all Markov numbers are composite. So it sounds like, wow. <laughs> but that's a really fundamentally new fact. And the first serious fact, it seems, about Markov numbers. Uh, you might think that this should be a triviality, but if you look at the end of Hooley's book where he laments about the lack of understanding of executing any, a Brunsev can't be executed on, on, on a Lacanry sequence. So he says, take 2 to the n plus 5. 
and he puts in the Artin conjecture that he's just solved and other assumptions, he's tr but he's not able to prove, even assuming that, uh, his proof under the Riemann hypothesis of the Artin conjecture, he's not able to prove that 2 to the n plus 5 for n up to capital N, almost all of those numbers are composite. So we have that much more gas in the situation here compared to a torus. That would be a torus case where a strong approximation never happens. This is a case of a nonlinear action, which is not, and the torus case uh, that he's dealing with is a linear action. Our w theorems work for any, this is why I call them Markov like surfaces. So I want you to look at S, A, B, C, D here, which is just adding linear terms there. There's also a D there. Or more generally, I have a quadratic equals a cubic. So <laughs> if you don't like it, it's a bit like Weierstrass form. You put Y squared on the one side and you put the cubic on the other side if you're making an affine elliptic curve. Here, it, we, one more variable, I'm putting the quadratic on this side and the cubic there. And then I can, in fact, always switch the roots of the quadratic. But when I do this, I will introduce denominators if I have serious coefficients A in front here. I don't mind that. That'll give me S integers. And I can do this in a number field with S integers. And in that setting, it's no longer true. Markov's theorem is no, lo it's no longer true that there are only finitely many orbits of gamma. So the, the Z points, or the S integral points, in Markov's situation decomposed into one orbit. And uh, for these guys, it's finitely many orbits. But in general, it might be that there are infinitely many orbits. This is uh, I think first observed by Silverman. So there could be infinitely many orbits, and now you say we're in the thin case. Very relevant for this conference. We're in the thin case, but these orbits are sufficiently fat that each one does the job for strong approximation. And we have no other way to study it. So it's a case where we're in a thin situation, and it's the only tool in town, but it's sufficiently good. So all our methods work to prove strong, whatever I've stated here for the Markov, for these. And I wanted to emphasize that you could be in a thin situation. And you trust Cayley in all this work? Yes. Uh, so Cayley in proving, the way Cayley proved that a cubic projective of an algebraically closed field has uh, 27 lines, was he brought it into, he brought the general projective, he, he made these affine pieces are, as you vary A, B, C, and D, affine pieces of a general projective cubic, and he used this in a way, I'll, uh, and I'll show you exactly what he used, the Cayley cubic, to prove, that was general enough for him to prove his theorem on 27 lines. That's so how he proved it. Did you do some of these theories with the best ones? No. No, 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 no. So there's some, uh, it's not that every affine thing can be brought into this affine piece. These are projective pieces of parts of a general these are affine pieces of a general cubic. No, but it would mean that by rationally, you could do this. By rationally, yes. Okay. Not so obvious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. No, that's what he does. Okay. So, but in terms of integers, it's a different game. All right. So now let me show you pictures of the real points. And these, ha these have been studied by Goldman in a beautiful series of papers because these, uh, another way of thinking of this. Uh, these Markov equations as S, A, B, C, D, and especially the case phi equals K, these Markov equations happen to be the character varieties, and the real points here, which is what he's interested in, the, re the character varieties of the representation, the character varieties of the once punctured torus. Once punctured torus. Your, your mouth will open a little, a little more just now. <laughs> okay. So let's look at uh, phi equals k, the real points. This is the Markov case. There's 0, 0, 0 there. And then you have four pieces like that, which are the real solutions in affine three space. And these are all the same. They can be permuted into each other. And uh, it's not hard to show, and, and Goldman shows each one of these. The, the mapping class group is the Markov group. It's exactly the same action. It's a nonlinear action. And it's acting here is the action on Teichmuller space itself. That particular piece is Teichmuller space. Now, if I increase k from 0, that was k equals 0. If I increase k, a little ball, so the, the, little, the, the point in the origin now grew into a little ball there. 
And the mapping class group, or the Markov group, is acting on this. It's acting properly discontinuously still on these four pieces, but on this it all of a sudden acts ergodically. There's a natural symplectic form that it introduces relative to which gamma is acting, measure preserving relative to this symplectic action. And this action in this part is ergodic. Now you increase till where they just touch. That's the famous scaly cubic. It's got these uh, singularities which are conic on the four corners and where you can compute a lot. And the whole mapping class group theory is conjugated to a linear action. Yeah? So everything I say today does not work for that. That's sort of the linear case. So it's actually last lecture. And then if you increase k, these things become one component, and it acts ergodically on that component until, so this is, I'm just reviewing, until k is, I think it's 16. I, I did it by memory when I was writing this yesterday. It might have been 18. I have to go back to this paper. But there, a non-wandering component appears. Uh, it's not ergodic once k is uh, sufficiently large. So the action's extremely complicated on the real points, but well understood in the sense that it's ergodic or proper. However, it's the action of the co on the complex points that's absolutely fundamental to us. And it seems that the Teichmuller people have never studied the action on the complex points because it seems not to fit into the, there are no interpretations in terms of Teichmuller. Uh, gamma is, S, the group is exactly G, uh, SL, GL2Z, the, it's a mapping class group of the one puncture torus in this example. Yeah, there are parts which have been studied, these quasi Fuchsian parts, yeah. But I'm talking about all complex points. And for these all complex points, they are fundamental to me, only for one reason. Finite fields see them. And the reason finite fields see them is the following. Suppose I had a finite complex orbit, a finite complex orbit in A3. I take a, pr and those coordinates will lie in Q bar. That's not hard to show. So I have a finite orbit with integer, with uh, algebraic number entries. I take that finite orbit. I take a prime, ordinary prime number, which in that extension field splits completely. Then the finite field that you see, the ring of integers mod P, is basically my finite field at the bottom. And if I have a finite orbit, then for this P, that finite orbit will show its ugly head. And so I have to understand all the finite orbits of the action of the mapping class group on the complex points. And we classify them because we need to, because in simply to formulate what strong approximation is. So let's go into that. So theorem four, there are only finitely many gamma orbits on the Q-bar points. And we have, and I'll show you the Diophantine theorem that resolves this. The Diophantine theorem is effective, and you can find these finitely many orbits. And it's absolutely critical for our proof and for the formulation of the general conjecture. After we did this, and I started looking around, I couldn't understand, <laughs> wondered if, why didn't nobody know this fact? What are the finite orbits of this action, or even more generally? And it turns out there, there, there was some, there are people who know it. The Brogan and Machaco in identifying which Payne Lave six equations are algebraic functions of their variable actually answer this question in special cases. Let me just explain that very carefully, quickly, because it's quite a beautiful theory. And it's a generalization of what uh, of Schwartz's list for F2 ones, but in this nonlinear setting. So Payne Lave looked at all second order nonlinear ordinary differential equations which have the Payne Lave property. The Payne Lave property is that the solutions are meromorphic in their variable z. Move around, but the essential singularities are only at 0, 1, and infinity. And he classified all such nonlinear second order equations into six families, of which Payne Lave six is the most interesting, because that's where the monodromy group is non abelian. The only case where the monodromy group is non-abelian. This monodromy group is now a non-linear monodromy group, not a linear monodromy group. In other words, we have the second order equation, and we take a solution at, a, at some point away from 0, 1, and infinity, and then I go around the cycle, and only depends on the homotopy class of the cycle. I come back, I get to a solution again, but now I'm but I'm actually some complicated transformation, if I have a, a set of parameters for the conditions on the solution, to what I started off with. And so 
in this theory of pain lavey people have found very clever coordinates on which this action is can be computed and so if you take this pain lavey here it's pain lavey 6 it's got a certain number of parameters uh, uh, there's a remarkable theorem uh, Iwasaki is the sort of key step in the end there is that <coughs> If the monodromy group, so we have a second order equation, so it'll be two parameters, so we'll be on a surface. When I go around, I'll have a map that takes me from the surface to itself. In the case of the uh, S, A, B, C, D, what I call Cayley normal form, those surfaces, the, uh, the, the, if the, in the right coordinates, the Markov moves that I've been writing down, or the mapping class group, happen to be the monodromy group. No more, no less. So in the right corner, it's exactly the monodromy group. And as in ordinary monodromy, the monodromy is finite, is equivalent to the solution being an algebraic function of its variable. If you want to classify all pain lave sixes which are algebraic, the problem is reduced to understand all the finite orbits of the action of this Markov moves on S, A, B, C, D. And that's what much, uh, uh, De Broven, in an amazing paper, uh, and uh, Matsako do in the case, of the special case of pain lave sixes, which reduce to the mark of phi equals k, and these other two names that I'm afraid I have trouble pronouncing, Lisovi and Tik, <laughs> uh, do the same for the general case, with a remarkable consequence that they've identified all pain lave six which are algebraic. It's as, it's as uh, this was sought after Hitchin was writing down some algebraic ones. Other people were writing algebraic ones. This is a complete classification of all algebraic ones. And the key computation is to prove, is to identify what are the finite orbits. This is critical for us. I better get moving here. Uh, so we have a proof. And then, of course, when I saw this, I thought, well, how does he prove this? I know what I'm using. And I look, and uh, it's quite remarkable. Uh, the proof they use is... Uh, for the F21s, there's an old proof of Gordon of Schwartz's list using algebraic number theory and properties of roots of unity, not using reflections, which is the usual way people do it. And in that proof, uh, they look, so uh, De Broven, who I chatted with a little bit, they look back at this proof, and it turns out that there's a key lemma there, which is the starting, which they use, which is the point that Gordon uses. And they're able to use it to prove a special case of Lang's GM, which is what <laughs> we'll be using to solve this. So it's not surprising in the end. The, the key tool is it's the starting point of what we use. So in these special cases, they solve this handsomely. Now I can state what the main conjecture is. So given uh, any of those surfaces, the main conjecture is not. So in the Markov case, we check. We prove that the only orbits, finite orbits of the action of the, Mar of the Markov moves on that surface are 0, 0, 0. The only finite orbit is 0, 0, 0. That's why the conjecture There's one orbit which is 0, 0, 0, and there's the other one is just one orbit. In general, you have to first find your finitely many Q bar orbits, which you can always do by a method that I'm going to explain, That's, which is related to this classification of pain love A6. Once you have those in your hand, the strong approximation is modified. It says that when you take a large prime P, your reduction mod P is possibly these finite orbits that you know, know, know a priori, which you can compute whether the splitting field is contained in the Q-bar coordinates there, which is a straightforward thing. Those orbits are fixed. And then the, there's only one other orbit. There's one massive orbit. Is, is this the same for S index? S S, S was any one of those surfaces, right? Any one of the surfaces. So the reduction mod P of the was just for was just for Markov, correct? Yeah, right. Exactly. Turns out that, and I think Alex will talk a little bit about this kind of thing. There, there's a formulation of a problem which is uh, intimately connected to a special case of this, concerning Nielsen moves on pairs of generators of SL2 of FP which we are solving here yeah, in, the, in the sense of for all but this kind of exceptional P, uh, which was formulated in the last few years separately, coincidentally, by Wanderlei and McCullough. So they, checked uh, they were doing numerical experiments. All right, 
So that's uh, what the general formulation is. All our methods work in general, and I want to say a couple of words about the tool. Uh, so, because the tools are, are ad hoc, we have no tools from uh, the kind of thing that Nori uses or anything like that in the linear case that we see how to adapt. This is really a nonlinear dynamical action, and we're looking at this, trying to understand the transitivity of this action. So let me explain the idea that we use anyway. And it's not that different to Goldman's proof of the ego. If you look at his proof of the ergodicity on that compact piece, for example, he will use uh, certain conic sections that we're using here over the finite field, but we're proving something much stronger. We're not proving that there's a big orbit. We're proving much more than there's a big orbit. We're proving there's only one orbit. And that's because it's a finite set that you could expect that to have no exception. So the idea is this. I have this equation. I'll do the Markov case. And I look at a conic section. Suppose I fix x1. Then I have the involution in x2 and x3. Uh, excuse me. If I fix x1, x2, I have the involution in <laughs> x3. I also have the involution in x2. And if I take those two involutions and I compose them, they will now still fix x1. And they'll do something in x2 and x3. And the map is still linear. It hasn't become nonlinear yet. It will be a rotation in the plane. For each x1, it's a different plane. So I take x1 <coughs> equals a constant. I have a conic section over a finite field. And I look at the rotation that uh, the other two guys induce. And I will be co I'm, trying to make, I'm, I'm trying to make myself big, connected to many guys. So I'll be connected to everybody in that rotation that I, that, that's induced there. Now, that rotation has some order. So it's an element in SL2FP, and it's got some order. Its trace is given by x1. And if that order is maximal, so if that order is maximal, I will actually trace out, I'll be connected to everybody in my conic section. And if I go now to another conic section in another plane, and that's also maximal, I'll be connected to everybody there. And then I can start trying to see if these conic sections intersect each other. And then this is how we build the cage. But this requires that I be maximal. And of course, this is where you see the divisors of p minus 1 and p minus plus 1. Those are orders of elements in SL2FP enter, and they make life very difficult. So if the order is small, we don't know what to do. And in that case, uh, the, the idea is I'm going to try, say, if my order is, say, T1, I'm connected to all these T1 guys. I look at the guys it's connected to and hope that it's connected to a guy of order bigger than T1, and then I can proceed to make myself eventually get to the cage. Well, that boils down to a uh, an equation over a finite field, and the basic equation is this equation. C plus B over C equals eta plus one, uh, one over eta. B is not one, so it's a non-trivial equation. It's an irreducible cur plane curve in FP. Okay, the number of solutions of that is not a difficult thing. But because I'm in my subgroup, I don't know what order I'm hitting. I'm in a subgroup of order T1. So I have a subgroup of the multiplicative group, either of FP. These are the eigenvalues of the transformation, or FP squared. So C is in this order H, uh, a subgroup of order H1. And I want eta, which is the guy, another guy that I'm connected to, a bigger order. I'd love to have that bigger order. So the first thing I want to show is, well, all the guy, amongst all the guys I'm connected to, one has a bigger order, so I need to bound from above the number of solutions to this. Now, if T1, the starting guy, is bigger than square root P, you write down an equation here, and that equation is an equa a, a, a curve over a finite field of some genus. And you can use the Riemann hypothesis for curves. The Riemann hypothesis for curves is very good if the genus is less than square root P. But if the genus is bigger than square root P, it's completely useless. And we have to s <laughs> deal with everything that comes our way. In any event, if t is bigger than p to the half, use the Riemann hypothesis. And you can actually quickly connect yourself up to something of maximal order. And by definition, the cage are all the guys which have max maximal order. And that set's really large by now. And you're connecting yourself to that set. So your big difficulty here is when the order you start off with is small. And then you don't know what to do, and Riemann doesn't help. But there are good proofs of Riemann, and there are bad proofs of Riemann. And the proof, the algebraic proof, is not good, because it only gives you <laughs> the proof. There's a proof of Stepanov, which gives much more information in some cases, and miraculously does here. 
And it's just an upper bound for the number of solutions. So let me state what we really need. We have this fundamental equation. X is in a subgroup, Y is in a subgroup. Let me assume the subgroup that we're starting off is H1, and the other subgroup I'm assuming is smaller. And the number of solutions to this equation of the field FP is at most uh, clearly H1, because if I choose X in H1, then Y uh, 2H1. So 2H1 is a trivial bound, and what we need is a power saving in the bound. But H1 can be arbitrarily small. So this, uh, as I said, Ve doesn't help, but we give a proof using Stepanov's methods. And then there's a quite beautiful theorem of Kovaya and Zanye, which actually gives better bounds than we have. Uh, and then Bogan is a magician, absolute magician. And I didn't believe this at first. He gave a proof of this using just this one equation, using Semaretti trotter using pure combinatorics. Uh, the Stepanov method works for a slew of equations, including this one, which is what we need. So he's got a, a Semaretti trotter theorem. Semaretti trotter is a theorem in the, uh, in the plane about incidences between lines and planes, uh, points and lines. And it gives you an upper bound, a non-trivial upper bound for the number of incidences, which is better than the trivial upper bound. And Bogan formulated a few years ago, and this paper seems to have gone completely unnoticed in a finite field, a version which is a, I like to call the projective Semaretti trotter. And in this case, you don't have points in the, in the plane and lines. You have points in projective space, and you have a subset of two-by-two two matrices which are acting linearly projectively, and you say x is uh, incident to y if x is g times y projectively. And he gives a non-trivial upper bound, and you can use that to also give this power saving and to allow us to complete the analysis. Well, that doesn't complete the analysis. What happens now is if you start off with something which is like order p to the epsilon, very small, we can now connect it to the cage unconditionally. If you start with something which is just bounded its order, we know that we may can't succeed because we may be in one of these traps. So if we are in a very small set, we lift to characteristic zero and then need to solve the equation over q bar. So it's quite natural that we had to do that, and we do. And in that case, we have to identify all the q bars. So this is where you get the log p to the one-third lower bound from this lifting to characteristic zero, and then an effective null Stalinger argument or any easy argument. So I just want to end by explaining the uh, understanding, which we absolutely need, of the finite orbits of this action on Q bar points. The, these rotations that I was telling you about, if I'm working over the complex numbers now, and I want to un understand if the orbit's finite or not, I have these rotations that I just described. And these rotations are infinite or finite order, depending on whether the eigenvalue is the root of unity or not. So if the three rotations that are involved in the, in the different direction, in the different uh, uh, conic sections are all uh, finite order, it means that I'm solving an equation in roots of unity. And this is the Lang's GM, which is decisive in this kind of problem. Turns out that uh, an equation in roots of unity has complete linear structure. So if you look at an equation like this, that would be the SK case, and these must be roots of unity. It looks, I don't give a uh, a, a bound on the order of the roots of unity, but it's linear. So let me just state Lang's GM, because if you've never seen it, it's a fantastic thing. Laurent proved this. I gave a proof of it some years ago. The, all proofs are effective. I didn't know that had been solved. It was a conjecture of Lang, and it's the heart and the beginning of all Andre Ort. In fact, uh, the proof I gave was a worse proof, but it's the one that generalizes. This is what Zimmerman and Peeler use in the end. It's, that, it's the argument that I was using here to give this proof. So here's this Lang gem. It's a fantastic statement. Take a variety in C star to the M. It's worth knowing because this is, I found this to be useful on many equations. You have any system of equations over any field, any, uh, and you have an algebraic set. And you want to count, you want to look at all the torsion points on satisfying these equations. So these are points whose coordinates are roots of unity. So I'm looking at the torsion points on this variety. Turns out you can replace the variety 
by a finite union of linear spaces of tori or translates of tori by rational points and it's effective you can compute them so the proof is entirely effective you can find this finite number of tori or translates of tori such that the torsion points intersect v are, is the same as the torsion points intersect this finite union and that of course gives you the complete structure of uh, the potential so let me tell you if you have a gamma which has got a finite orbit then the set of points that you're looking at have to lie in this finite structured set that doesn't mean that's gamma invariant but that's a necessary condition and then you just check once you have finitely many points and you have to go to a to complete this complete <laughs> to complete the classification for example of all plane of a6 is there about I think 50 or 60 of them in that special case anyway you uh, identify these and then you uh, check which are invariant and again and you find all these so the only reason we don't have the full theorem and we have need a new idea is precisely that if you start with something which is bounded we okay or up to log p to the one-third and then if it's bigger than p to the epsilon we join to the cage and what about between there and there there's a gap now uh, the way we are arguing is this very crude combinatorial argument where we're saying all right I want to take my guy I've got some order I want to connect myself to something which is a bigger order so I'm doing that combinatorially by saying well all the guys I'm connected to if they all of smaller order I mean I'm in business if I can bound that number but imagine that my uh, P is a very large P, P is large and P minus one has got is k factorial then this argument will require that I have these divisors which are a whole sequence of them and the power gain will not be enough to advance me so as long as p squared minus one does not is not abnormally smooth the proof works and in this very very big enemy case we stuck and we would love a new idea thank you